Hi, and welcome to Composer Talks with White Bear PR. Today we are presenting a masterclass, a workshop with Ronit Kirchman, and uh, the workshop is titled The Musical Evolutions in the Sinner. A few words about Ronit. Uh, Ronit creates music for film, television, theater, dance, multimedia installation, and also for the concert stage. Ronit is an accomplished visual artist and an author and she scored all three seasons of The Sinner and also created a new main title theme music for each season. So without further ado, here's Ronit with The Musical Evolutions in The Sinner. Hi, I'm Ronit Kirchman. It's a pleasure to spend some time with you all today contemplating the art of composing and in particular the art of composing music for narrative. In this talk, we'll first take a bird's eye view of some essential originating questions about the nature of music and form and consider how these can come to life in the context of film and television scoring. Then I'll take a look at one of my recent projects, the score for the season number three of USA Network show The Sinner and explore how I've approached thematic development from this perspective. In the second half of the talk, you'll also have a chance to hear some of my music for this season as part of our discussion, which I hope you'll enjoy. One of the wonderful things that I want to highlight here is that the language of musical development, the process of building a musical vocabulary is actually very compatible with and complementary to the development of story. There are many times that as film composers, we have to find ways of talking with our collaborators in ways that don't rely too much on musical te uh, technology and terminology. And I think that's a really important part of our job. Um, but today, in the context of this masterclass, I want to enjoy the opportunity to observe that the internal dynamics of music, its building blocks, and all of the nitty gritty mechanisms with which it's built can actually be harnessed to better articulate and amplify the psychological dynamics of the story and the characters. The score can actually illuminate aspects of the story in ways that are related to how it's been implemented on a musical structural level. So there's a core concept I'd like to introduce, which is the idea of a theme as a kernel or a seed that can generate a wide variety, even an infinite subset of forms in time and space. This is something I'm quite passionate about and have been exploring for many years in my concert pieces and in my remix performances as well. But today, let's look at how it works in a film or TV score. Now, I know we're all familiar with the idea of theme and variations, but I think it's important not to oversimplify it too much because this allows us to stay more nimble and have a multi-dimensional mindset that lets us pivot and generate more interesting variety and relationships in the musical outputs. So I think this nonlinear attitude toward understanding themes lets you look at them in many more ways and from different points of view, which is particularly valuable in a scoring context because music is so essential in creating a defining point of view at every moment in a story. So what we're thinking about is the theme more as a sculpture, and there are different ways that you can turn it, explore it, different routes that you can take through time and space. And of course, with the added aesthetic parameters, it becomes a really multi-dimensional space, not 3 or 4D, but more than that. Now, the first time you articulate a kernel or seed, it can definitely be audible and sequential, but I think that it has a core identity which is not inherently linear. Um, my concept of the seed theme is more like a piece of code that gets translated into space and time each time you sing it or in computer language, iterate it. And this can be a useful way of looking at themes because it gives you more creative options for how to approach it when it comes time to vary it up in a story. Another way of thinking about it is kind of an epigenetic model. Um, and where would the DNA of a film score theme come from? Well, I feel that essentially it's coming from the material of the story itself in conversation with the imagination of the composer and of course the rest of the creative team. And then the moment to moment environment of the story catalyzes the specific forms of the variation that occur. So these would embody all the emotions and dynamics and tonal qualities of that moment. So I, I'm a big fan of thinking about how this 
this uh, material can kind of play out in very different ways depending on the circumstance. A couple last thoughts about the kernel model before we move to listening to some specific Q examples. Um, so the first time you uh, articulate or iterate the seed theme, um, it can be very developed. In the case of the theme that I'll be sharing with you today, it, it is, it's a five minute plus theme. But it can also be very pithy uh, and compact. It can be a few signature notes, a motif, a special chord progression or a rhythm. And in some cases, I think the identity of the theme is tied to certain sonic qualities or instrumentations. But that really is a case by case kind of thing. And the seed model is uh, also very similar to how we comprehend and interact with the head or the core tune in jazz. It's also very resonant with uh, remix theory and practice. And it's also really similar to when you take a song and you want to make an innovative cover of it. The idea here is that generated variation can be really different in tempo, mood, instrumentation, key, meter. Sometimes it's really easy to recognize, oh, that's a cover of that tune, for example. But th there are other times when the relationship is so almost tenuous on the concrete level that they don't immediately read as related to the original. Now, I think that that's really a wonderful uh, tool to have because then you have a very broad uh, palette, but it's subliminally related. And I think that that um, connection, the fact that it exists is felt. Um, by the audience as well. Um, this idea is also kind of a fractal idea in that it's scalable. It can have a macro implementation over many seasons of a series, and it can have micro implementations in um, literally the repetition of phrases within a particular cue. So um, to get a little existential, <laughs> I think the the whole fact of variation and thinking about it leads us to a very fundamental question um, about existence. What makes this form, this theme, recognizable as itself? When does one form, one theme, become another? As the variations multiply and mutate, they take on their own life, and in some cases, they become a new identity altogether. I think in the context of a film or television score, when you are weaving themes with other themes, some of which are really specifically associated with specific characters. Um, and you can create hybrid themes that track the development of the story. You're also kind of opening up um, a very big universe of understanding. And um, I think that's part of the reason why we all want to tell stories, because it has that capacity to open our minds and hearts. Um, so with that in mind, um, and so kind of a perfect segue to talking more uh, in focus, zoomed in on The Sinner season three and my Whirly Bird theme. Um, this question of the identity of a theme, of when one thing becomes another, uh, is very uh, uh, appropriate for The Sinner because the show is an exploration of the collective unconscious which is like the big primordial soup of archetypes and emotions shared by many individuals. And it also uh, is a show which explores mirrors of identity and psychological feedback loops, which if you're a fan of the show, you know, sometimes don't feed back in a productive or healthy way. <laughs> um, the center also takes a nonlinear reconstructive approach to time and memory and dreams and so on a meta level, it's a great environment for me to experiment with my approach to developing thematic material in the way we've been talking about. I'm going to focus on a particular theme in my score for season three of The Center as a case study in some of these ideas. This theme is called Whirly Bird. So I'll, I'll set up listening to the theme, which is the longest piece we'll be listening to today, it's about five minutes, with uh, some uh, details of the story and, uh, and the music. So the foundation of the season three story is a very close and unusual friendship between Jamie, played by Matt Bomer, and Nick Haas, played by Chris Messina. They become friends in philosophy class. Jamie, Jamie is less focused, more impressionable and vulnerable, and Nick is a very seductive and intelligent nihilist. He has a point of view which is increasingly destructive, 
And in a sense, he ends up infecting Jamie with his way of seeing the world. And therefore, the DNA metaphor we've been using is really very appropriate. Um, the whirly bird theme is, embodied to, uh, is embodying the DNA of their relationship. It's sinuous, it's complex, it's contemplative, and it's unsettling. It's hard to pin down, and it can shift in unexpected ways. So it kind of sneaks up on you, and it doesn't reveal immediately what it's going to become. The first iteration of it doesn't give the whole story away, <laughs> and it's quite moderate in tempo and feel. Um, but it has the, the bones of how uh, harmonies move. It's also very differentiated. It's written for nine string players, and each of those string players has, um, it's not traditional orchestral doubling. Each of those players has a, its own strand to weave into the helix. Um, and as the story progresses, this theme will mutate into more distortion and menace. Um, so, yeah, just in terms of the formative instrumentation, it also has in it um, kind of a built-in intimacy and focus, and um, this idea that uh, the each each of these strands has independence in a way that can actually shift the current of the group. And we got to record this theme um, at Capitol Records in LA. We did all of our sessions there. It's a really wonderful room. So um, I hope you enjoy listening to Whirly Bird.
A lot of times I will get the question um, from fans or journalists, how do you create the unsettling, uneasy sound of the sinner? I feel like I'm being pulled along and the tension just keeps going and going. Um, how do you sustain it? So there are a lot of different techniques I use to accomplish that. Um, some of those are um, in the realm of sound design for sure, um, but some of it is really structural and I, I want to take the um, moment just to explain how the Whirlybird theme actually um, has some built-in qualities to it that are very useful for that. So one of the qualities I really was going for is that it's, it's kind of the longest phrase in the universe, right? It never has a place to land. Just when you think it's unraveled, it creates a new arc out of it. And um, with the chamber ensemble, there's a way of doing that where each player has um, almost their own cycles they're going through, obviously related to some of the phasing ideas that we know from minimalism, but it's a different quality, It's um, which I hope that you can hear. But the idea is that you have, um, it's almost like a wave with different particles in it. So um, each vector, there's a sum of various vectors and the wave does travel in a certain overall direction, but each of those uh, mini currents is moving slightly differently within it. And I think that that, um, that kind of strand differentiation also on the level of metrical subdivisions is quite effective at giving you that feeling that there's no place to land, that it keeps rolling. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of compound meters here because I, not for the sake of uh, overcomplicating things for the musicians, but because I think, you know, as a player, when I see um, that kind of compound meter, it's, it creates a longer phrase in my mind. Um, and uh, the other thing um, that might be worth noting is there's a viola melody that kind of emerges out of this, um, out of this uh, collective. And um, I, I love the idea that that strand, um, it, it emerges as a melody, but it is actually kind of equal to all the other strands. Um, and of course, I use dynamics and the arrangement to allow that to happen. Um, but it's this idea of certain elements can, there are all sorts of elements in this environment and you have to watch the story to find out which elements are going to come to the surface and speak as um, kind of the voice of the show. And that's a dynamic shifting relationship. And I, I think that's part of why dramatically people are also um, very kind of captivated by um, the landscape of the center. Um, now let's uh, listen to a much shorter piece, the uh, main titles. Um, I create new main titles music for each se season of the center. Um, we get new visuals each season. And it's um, our a moment to give a little bit of a gestural glimpse of what this season is about in a kind of aesthetic way. So the main titles always have a sense of growth and even within their short uh, time period, they have a progression to them. I would say that season one had the darkest curve. We were really going for a sense of impending threat and doom. Um, the main title for season two begins with a darkness that opens up into a wider sense of possibility, which I think is somewhat unexpected. And in a way, if you look at the arc of the story in season two, um, there is an element of that. There's uh, quite a bit of uh, emotional opening and redemption available at the, in that finale. Um, even though, of course, um, in the center, it's never tied up in a bow. There's always more, more trouble ahead in some way. <laughs> um, the main title for season three is Propulsive and Dark. Um, it has these uh, shards and glimmers of light. Um, and it's woven with a complexity that can't easily be solved. It opens into a question. So th for the main titles this season, um, Whirly Bird was a natural fit as a source of material. So in the main titles, I'm also unraveling and reweaving threads of Whirly Bird with some of the other signature elements from the season. So I hope you enjoy listening to the main titles from season three of The Sinner.
The next piece that we'll be listening to is a cue from the beginning of episode 304. Um, it's called Pick a Number. Jamie has called his best friend from college, Nick, after almost 20 years of no contact. Um, and over dinner, Nick confronts him saying, you wanna feel the truth like we did in school, nothing else matters. And uh, until now, we haven't really addressed why, why now, why should he be calling him now? And it's really because Jamie is feeling a sense of loneliness and existential emptiness. And Nick was a person who, even though in a scary way, um, he did fill that void for, for Jamie. So this is a good spot to explain what a whirlybird is. It's a folded paper game. It's also known as a fortune teller. And you, you go like this with it. Um, and you make successive choices. And eventually, kind of the combination of the design of the whirly bird, which is kind of a stand in for fate or chance, and um, your choices create the final outcome. Um, Nick uses this device as a way of inviting, inviting fate in and chance in to determine life choices, but usually on a very dark spectrum of choices available. <laughs> um, and yeah, it just becomes more and more dangerous and lethal in terms of what the spectrum he's offering um, is. And in this scene, he brings out a whirly bird and Jamie understands immediately that it's an invitation to danger. So here, you'll hear a much more intense version of the theme. Um, I call it whirly bird reversal because it incorporates a compositional retrograde of the original. Um, and it's also implemented with a very different playing style, tempo and dynamic range and kind of more impassioned playing. Um, this then spins into a larger cue, which combines some of the electronic stutter rhythms and motifs associated with Jamie's inner life. Then we cut to the present where a volatile Jamie who's alone heads to New York City, having made his own whirly bird and Detective Ambrose is in pursuit because he, he knows something is, is, is going to be happening and it may not be good. So let's listen to Pick a Number from the fourth episode of season three of The Sinner.
So you can hear at the end of that cue, pick a number, um, that sense of opening happens when Jamie arrives at, in front of a work of art that kind of puts him in a different state of mind. But it might be interesting to note that those that chord is derived from the whirly bird theme as well. I'll be talking a little bit more about those um, kind of modular uh, chord vocabularies that I sp spun out of the original theme. So that's a case where I think even though it's not directly on the surface, and of course we needed to arrive in a place that's kind of like this for this scene, um, overall when you experience the arc of the cue, you feel hopefully like um, it's one uh, big arc that's all connected. Um, and I think part of that has to do with the fact that the material itself is connected um, at a deeper level. So let's uh, listen to another cue. We'll move forward to episode 306. Um, 306 is kind of an origin story uh, for young Nick and young Jamie. And um, just ex examining what exactly did happen in college, what was their relationship all about? Um, this cue begins in the college dining hall. Nick is pushing Jamie to accept, you know, major risk taking and uh, tempting death in the face of uncertainty as kind of a general MO for life. Um, and he leads him to a bridge that's really high up. Um, it's above some water, but probably not enough water. <laughs> and he dares him to jump off. It's the second time that he's dared him to do it. Um, and last time Nick did it. This time he's like, you got to do it, man. And uh, Jamie does take the, the dive. So on a fundamental level, uh, right here, Nick is upping the ante of their relationship. He's making it really a life or death uh, proposition. And so the implementation of the Whirlybird theme really had to shift to communicate that escalation. Um, because of course, they're using the Whirlybird as part of this whole situation as well. Um, so there are a few techniques that before we listen, I just want to draw attention to. Um, like I was saying just now, there was a vocabulary of chords, um, kind of the essential chords of the Whirly Bird Suite that I um, then created into a new, obviously much longer piece because each chord is, is very, very long and has different, um, each chord would have slightly dynamic curves. Some of those were written in the text. Sometimes as an improviser, I'd love to kind of, you know, get in there with the players and, and outline a few different options for how we are um, going to uh, sing that particular chord. Um, and so they were recorded, obviously, at a very slow tempo, um, but to create this modular vocabulary of harmony um, that, that actually found its way into uh, uh, many cues. And um, sometimes they were transposed to different tone centers. And as the, as the show progresses, you hear them kind of more and more. Um, and now the, this next cue called The Crime is Pretending is one of those cues. Um, and the chords at the opening are also going through some custom signal chains. Um, so I'm processing them in a dynamic way. Um, and this is creating a much more ominous quality, disturbing quality, um, just in the, the sonic register of, of that harmonic material. And as, it, as the cue moves on, you'll hear the Whirlybird theme itself emerge more clearly, but within a dark and propulsive soundscape, interplaying with some of the other themes and motifs that I've been building through the season. Um, and including the, there's uh, kind of a very distinctive spatialized string ensemble pitch bend uh, melody, which recurs and it happens here as well. So here's the deep dive into The Crime is Pretending.
There are a couple of cues I'll be playing you from the finale, but before we do that, I just want to touch conceptually on um, two cues that we won't be listening to today, uh, just to give you an idea of the range of different implementations that the theme continues to have. So one of them called Sugar Berries accompanies Ambrose's nightmares when Jamie buries him alive. Retroactive spoiler alert. <laughs> um, and that's worth noting just because the music in that case is really Ambrose's music. It's no longer Nick's music, Jamie's music. It's become Ambrose's. Um, it's infected his dreams even. And then the other one happens when, um, another spoiler coming, um, Jamie murders the retired police chief. And that is the culmination musically of a series of um, soul pont tremolo, more intense versions of the theme, um, which have accompanied Jamie's metamorphosis into a killer. So there are some other threads that hopefully you'll get a chance to experience if you watch the show. Um, but let's move now to the finale to listen to a track called You're Not Alone. After Ambrose shoots Jamie in the last episode, he attends to him during his dying moments. It's a very poignant scene. Um, this cue also incorporates uh, whirly bird derived materials and a new melancholy melody also emerges over it. The original whirly bird theme has by now really become part of their shared vocabulary and it's interwoven into the fabric of the music that tells the story. And so the groundwork is already laid for new melody to emerge at this point. I think it's a very interesting thing that we've, we, at a point where we're reaching an arrival of sorts with the narrative, the music kind of wants to open into uh, new melodies and, and new themes itself. So let's listen to You're Not Alone. These two cues from the finale, the one you just heard, You're Not Alone, and the one that's coming up together, I think really embody the tragic nature of the story. And in the finale, um, we kind of get to experience that, which I think is so valuable because the season has been really full of uh, tension and it's a thriller and there's a lot of darkness. And I think having that opportunity for some catharsis is uh, really important and valuable. Um, and I think what's also interesting is those two cues are examples where it's almost like it's a, a case where it's almost like the microscope is going in on the fabric of the theme and you're seeing how the strands of harmony are, um, because of the slow rate of change, you're able to notice each layer coming in, each attack, the different nature of each attack and sustain, 
each layer's uh, shape in a very, very concrete and um, specific way, which I think um, lends itself to the, um, just the attention to emotion, the appreciation that that's something important. So the willingness to zoom in on the fact that even though this fabric has created a lot of death and destruction and tension and anxiety at the, um, the kind of the core of it in a way is that, that tragedy um, and that, that emptiness. Um, so let's listen to the last cue of the show this season. Um, we have been renewed for season four, so um, it's just the last cue of the season. Um, and uh, this runs continuously into the end credits. Uh, in the scene, Ambrose breaks down, he's processing everything that's happened, and he really allows himself to feel a deep wave of emotion. And he's with Sonia, and they, they hold on to each other. So it's called Together. Um, there's expression and flow, but there's not resolution. You know, it's, it's still kind of an open wound. Um, and the cue musically taking, is taking the bones of Whirly Bird to rebuild the next step forward. So again, the changes are stretched out. Um, it's, a, you know, the voicings are pared down. Um, each entrance and exit is very deliberate and obviously very much in conversation with the moment to moment dynamics of the characters in the picture, which I hope you'll get to see. So this is a new moment. It's rooted in everything that's come before. And um, on a musical level, I, um, music for narrative level, I find it exciting just because the theme has totally transformed at this point. Um, now it's Ambrose and Sonia's music um, and it speaks to that collective tragedy that's unfolded. So let's listen to Together. Well, that's it for today. I hope that you've enjoyed this journey through some of my music for The Sinner Season 3 and the chance to explore some different, hopefully mind-opening, thought-provoking ideas about developing musical themes in relationship to narrative. Um, as always, I want to uh, celebrate and emphasize that storytelling and making music are um, a wonderful and joyful process um, with so many, an infinite subset of options for joy and creativity. So I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and thanks so much for tuning in. Thank you so much, Ronit, for guiding us through the musical evolutions in the center. This was very insightful. I learned a lot even as amateur. And uh, the great thing is the music and uh, your storytelling took me right back to all those images and the great story this season. I'm a big fan of this in her, all three seasons. And, you know, if someone out there hasn't watched it yet, they should watch it on USA Network. Or I think it's on Netflix also, season one and two. Yes. Uh, we have a little bit more time left, uh, Renit. So I want to step away from the center now and uh, talk uh, a little bit about other things which might have to do with the sinner. 
Um, the first question I have, I know you're doing a lot of body work, breath work, uh, meditation, and I want to know how that influences your creativity and your scoring work. Um, well, I feel like it's uh, been really essential. And um, I think that the cumulative practice of it uh, also is, is significant because then you kind of have a, um, a, a nervous system memory, not just muscle memory, but um, a memory of uh, ways to repattern, ways to shift. I think a big emphasis of all the modalities that I've um, been immersed in is that uh, we are neuroplastic, we can evolve, and um, there's a, a lot of capacity for repatterning and, and choosing new, uh, new ways of looking at things. And I think that when you're, um, the other thing is, I, you know, my experience having participated also a lot in many theater workshops with actors and coaching vocalists um, is that, uh, you know, for a while there, I, <laughs> I um, felt, um, I don't want to say jealous, but like actors really, they're a, given, a, their job really requires a certain amount of emotional expression on the surface. And I think that oftentimes the um, societal structures that define being a composer or even being a, a musician, uh, you know, in an ensemble, certain even kinds of warm ups um, that are kind of no brainer for actors or vocalists. Well, you know, many musicians will feel a little bit shy about doing. Um, and I think I, I just decided that that's um, silly that these these techniques and ways of working with the body, they make the instrument more available. We're not, you know, brain and body. The brain and all the musical ideas that we have um, are part of a bodily and an embodied experience. So. Um, and you know, when you're scoring a film, you really, you're both actor and writer, just the language is music that you're using, but you, you have to be willing to feel. Um, and then at the end of the day or end of the night, kind of uh, ground and cleanse, but you are kind of a vehicle for um, expressing the, in, you know, the emotional um, landscape of this world. And I think embracing that is, is important. So I'm grateful to have many uh, practices in my toolkit that I can, um, you know, use and refer to, uh, you know, every day. And even if, you know, it's a day that's not super movement oriented, just the reference point in my mind of, well, let's take a different perspective. What if this, you know, what if I'm this character? Um, uh, just putting myself in different positions within the story. Uh, once you shake things up a little bit, you're able to hear things more clearly. I think that clarity is something that's really gained when you're um, kind of flexible and nimble within your body and, and mind. This is a weekend workshop I wanted to do for a <laughs> long time now. So I think you and I should do a, a weekend workshop in Palm Springs on the mountains that. for the Alliance for Women Film Composers one day. I think a lot of people could really benefit from that because, you know, you, you know, as artists, I feel often you get to your studio, you sit in front of your computer and, and uh, you know, how you describe also, how you, you feel more, it's more a collaborative uh, approach also because you are part of the storytelling more you let uh, you allow yourself to feel more and to get into that and I think that's yeah. a great approach yeah and I would say so you know uncertain having worked on many um, projects with very dark material I think that uh, you you end up learning how to um, process things in a healthy way and still be available for the full range, the full dynamic range of the storytelling. I think the detective, uh, detective Ambrose could definitely benefit from some of the body <laughs> work. Do some <laughs> <Christ>. <laughs> uh, so I, I mentioned the Alliance for Women Film Composers, you're a board member and you also co-created their mentorship program. Uh, can you talk a little bit why mentorship is important to you and uh, what mentors you've had in your life that helped you in your career? Um, well, I'm thrilled that we've been able to launch this program. Um, 
I feel that um, creating, like we were talking even in the talk right now about how the environment influences how potential expresses itself. And I think for a long time, the cultural environment, for whatever reason of film scoring, was not one that was particularly nurturing or conducive to women, didn't make them feel like they could do it. Now I think, you know, I feel fortunate that for whatever reason, um, I was able to navigate uh, through that uh, time and persist and, and still do it. But I, I don't think it should be something where it's, uh, um, I think it should be accessible. I'm a big, uh, I, I feel that um, it's important to uh, make things accessible so that voices can speak. <laughs> um, we don't need to make it difficult to hear people for random, um, you know, uh, narrow reasons. So, <laughs> um, you know, in terms of mentorship, I think that at different times in my education and um, career, there have been times when I felt like there was n not a lot of mentorship and I needed them, didn't have it, and um, had to kind of supplement. And then there were times when it would kind of flood in and be there for me. So I would say, um, you know, early on, and this is, I would say, just a, in some ways, um, maybe because of my particular attitude toward music making wasn't necessarily always reflected in every educational environment. So I, um, in a way that encouraged me to look, look wide and, um, and synthesize. I had to kind of be my own mentor, but I kind of went to many different cultures of music making so that I could um, kind of synthesize, you know, how I, how I felt and make my own reflection in that sense. And then I think, you know, uh, certain moments in terms of film scoring were very um, were a big boost for me and very helpful. Like uh, the Sundance uh, Composers Lab Fellowship, um, I got that pretty early on in my activities as a film scoring composer, and it was just the fact of being selected was very reinforcing. And also, um, there were certain mentors there who I felt had good advice for me. You know, one of the ones that I often uh, you know, kind of call a shout out to is George Clinton, because I think he um, uh, was supportive of uh, my desire to have an original voice and not necessarily do things in the kind of tried and true way. And he also um, supported the what we've been talking about, the idea of being a whole person in your music. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, and I think um, also, sometimes collaborators who bring you on, they're not always musicians, but people who believe in you and, and want to work with you, even when you um, don't have 20 million credits, those people are, um, in a way, uh, you know, guiding or mentoring you. They're giving you an environment where you can spread your wings, and that's invaluable. I think we all need that. So the hope is with creating certain initiatives, like the mentorship program, that we'll be able to even the playing field and eliminate um, unfair and unnecessary obstacles um, so that everybody has access to um, the kind of support that can nurture creative voices. It's, it's so important. And it's always going to be an individual journey, but we want that journey to be joyful and um, help people to find the right connections and resonances on their way. So thank you again, Ronit. Thank you for this wonderful masterclass and thanks for all the great work you do for the Alliance for Women Film Composers, the mentorship program, and uh, you know all the people you are supporting and you're collaborating with on your journey. Thanks for this class. Thank you. Thanks so much, Thomas. It's really been a lot of fun. <laughs> Bye.